This is session seven in our training of Monday Night Live and Good News Evangelism. And session seven is concerning our presentation and our middle finger and wh how we talk about Jesus. And of course, the title of this session is God's Remedy. You see, God's remedy for our sin is Jesus Christ crucified. Romans 5, 8 says it so well. God demonstrated or commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid our penalty. He made it possible for us to be forgiven if we will receive him by faith. You know, I like to point out at this particular point just how amazing Jesus Christ really is. Of course, he's the son of God, but sometimes I don't think people realize how much difference he's made in the world. Even people who never believe in him or never trust him have been affected and impacted by his coming into the world. Uh, I was thinking about one of my favorite mentors uh, from years gone by, Dr. Dallas Willard, who taught at the University of Southern California. He was known all over the campus uh, as a Christian. He was a philosophy teacher, but his classes uh, would pack out every semester. And other professors would hear about his faith, and uh, they would rather... Uh, carefully approach him and say, and, uh, and you are a follower of Jesus? Uh, to which Dr. Willard would say, did you have someone else in mind? And the point he would make with them is, who else is in that class? Who else really belongs in that list? Who has impacted the world the way Jesus did? So while we think about Jesus as God's remedy, let's think about how he has affected life. These are all things that you can use as talking points to talk to people about Jesus. Uh, and I've used every one of these at various times when I'm talking to people. For instance, he changed the way we number our years. Now, uh, we for many, many years talked about BC before Christ and AD, which by the way has never meant after death. It means Anno Domini, it's Latin for the year of our Lord. And so uh, that calendar testifies to the life of Jesus. And even though they've now started trying to use CE, Common Era, and BCE, the years are still based on the life of Jesus and his entry into the world. And because our calendar more or less dominates trade and commerce, even uh, countries that do not have a Christian heritage have to accommodate themselves to the Christian calendar. They have to deal with the numbering of years on the life of Jesus. I was thinking also about the area of education. Most people don't realize that the university was born in the church, that the first universities were in churches, and that there were spiritual leaders who taught some of those first classes. Ultimately, the universities began to have their own identity, uh, but even then, they had a strong relationship to the Christian faith. And so education was shaped by the coming of Jesus. Uh, schools uh, were first started in churches. Children were taught to read and write. In America, until well into the 1800s, the textbook for helping children learn to read was the Bible. And on and on we could go. Every time you pass a university or you pass by a school, you're passing by a testimony to the impact of Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, I like to say that uh, that Jesus uh, is underlying even uh, the studies of science, the whole concept that the earth can be studied and that there are mysteries that can be discovered uh, came out of the belief that this world was created by a God of order and design. And so uh, even though some people try to see science as opposed to faith, in fact, science arose out of faith. And it's a relatively modern phenomena for some scientists to take agnostic or atheistic positions. What about medicine? Every time you see a hospital, you're seeing a testimony to the coming of Jesus Christ. You see, the world that Jesus came to did not care for the common people. Any kind of medical treatment that might be available was reserved for the uh, royalty and the aristocracy. Common people were not given the opportunity to receive medical care. But the coming of Jesus made it clear, think of his healing miracles, made it clear that all people are, are valuable 
uh, and that there ought to be care given to all people. And so the very idea that uh, even though, you know, as in our country, there might be people who have no insurance, but you know what? They get care. There is such a heart for meeting the needs of people. And, and many of the first hospitals, in fact, nearly all of the first hospitals were Christian and still many of our hospitals, fine hospitals in the world and in America have Christian origins. Think about the impact of Jesus on society. Let me use two examples. Let me use the example of New Guinea. You may not realize it, but well into the modern era, New Guinea in the highlands was populated by cannibals. When they would defeat their enemies, they would eat them. Uh, and uh, cannibalism was just one aspect of the evil and the ungodliness of those pagan peoples in the islands of New Guinea. But bold missionaries went up among those cannibals and began to share Christ with them. And through a series of miraculous events, now that same landscape in New Guinea is dotted with churches and with communities that have been impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ and the value of and importance of human life that goes with that understanding. Or think, for instance, about uh, India, and think about how in India, when a man died, they would uh, cremate him on a funeral pyre, and they would burn his living widow on the fire. It was supposed to be a sign of her devotion to him, that she would not go on with her life. Not all of them would do that willingly, as you might expect, but you see, long before there was any kind of Christian impact in India and churches were organized, it was the Christian witness of those who were there serving that rose up in opposition to that practice and suppressed it and moved it aside. And so Jesus had an impact on India even more so than just those who came to know Christ. You maybe have heard that Mahatma Gandhi was a very careful student of Jesus in fact, he said a very sad thing. He said, I would be a Christian if it were not for Christians. He saw such a difference between the teachings of Jesus and the behavior of some of the English colonialists who professed to be Christians that it was a stumbling block for him. But there's no question that his activities of peaceful resistance to injustice was transformative to India, and he got that from Jesus Christ. When you think about how celebrities in our country who make no effort to claim any kind of faith involve themselves in benevolence, think about that. How they help uh, starving children around the world, how they participate in missions of mercy around the world, and how they give money, uh, not, just, uh, not just those in the entertainment culture, but some others who have prospered greatly in our country have been very generous in their giving. You understand that doesn't come out of a secular mindset. The secular mindset says it's all about me, my success, and my power. But Christianity has influenced even those who don't follow Jesus to say, no, it's not just about me. I have a responsibility to help others. And when you see that, I don't think they even realize uh, that they have been affected by a Christian philosophy in the way they're seeking to live their lives. Even warfare has been impacted by the coming of Jesus. You see, there was a lot of total warfare in the ancient world, but the coming of Jesus Christ raised the issue of when is a war warranted? And so Augustine in North Africa in the 400s AD came up with something that he called a just war theory. And St. Thomas Aquinas later took Augustine's ideas and, and developed them a bit further. Do you know that before we went into Iraq many years ago, they were sitting around talking about, is this a just war? And they were using the theorems of just war to make their decision about what they should do. The point I would make with you is that the Geneva Convention rules and all of the ideas about when is a war just and, and, and when is there an army that seems to have the right on their side and an army that seems to be uh, representative of evil, it is always based on 
Christian understanding of what is right and what is wrong. And it often goes back to Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas in the conversations about these things. During the Gulf War, I remember distinctly a broadcast on a news station in which some American soldiers had captured some Iraqi soldiers and they were begging for their lives. And I saw the American soldiers as they just gently extended their hand and said, you're all right, you're all right. While these soldiers were just in terror, of, they thought surely they would be killed. That was the way uh, of their dictator, Saddam, and, and they thought surely they would just shoot them, but they didn't. They said, you're all right. When I saw that video, I thought, that is what Christianity has done. I'm not suggesting those soldiers were Christians. What I'm saying is the understanding that even the enemy should be treated with some decorum and respect as a person of value, that comes out of the Christian faith. And so it's, it's amazing the impact uh, that Christ has made. Well, then think about books themselves. You know, there was a time when a book was just a rolled up piece of paper. A book was uh, just a papyrus or a parchment scroll like this. And uh, that was a book. And the word book was taken for thousands of years before Jesus came into the world by rolled up scrolls. If you went to the library of Alexandria, there would be some vases on, on uh, shelves and in those vases would be scrolls. That's what you would find in a library. Uh, and yet the coming of Jesus produced a group of people who needed to communicate a message that had verses scattered throughout the scrolls that they needed to use to make their case. For instance, in the prophecy of Isaiah, there would be a passage about the birth of Jesus and then a passage that would point to the crucifixion of Jesus. So how do I roll through that scroll to get to those various places? How do I communicate that and maybe even show that to someone that I'm teaching? And they hit upon the idea of cutting the scrolls into what we now know as pages and binding them together on the edge. And the technical name for that kind of book that we all know so well is the Codis. The Codis. And codices, the very concept of the codice was a Christian invention by those who were wanting to share the message of Jesus. So I often say, go into the largest library that you can think of, and every book on every shelf about every subject is a testimony to the impact of Jesus Christ on this world. Talk about an interesting conversation. I was at the University of Texas library one day, and a student across from me was doing some research. And at a certain point, he looked up at me and I said, do you know where these came from? He said, what do you mean, these books? I said, yes. I said, there was a time when a book was a rolled up scroll and you and I would be taking down scrolls off shelves, probably in jars if we were in the library. But this particular understanding of a book was invented by those who were sharing the message of Jesus around the world. As they cut up scrolls of scripture and bound them together like this. It was an awesome conversation with a student who had no idea of that particular little important point of history. So you see, I'm not just talking to you about Jesus. I'm talking to you about ways that you can talk to people about Jesus. Conversation starters that will help you share with them why did he make such a difference? What is it about Jesus that makes him greater than all who ever lived. Remember, in our Good News presentation, we point out that's usually the longest finger on your hand, and it reminds us of Jesus because he stands above all the people who ever lived. That's the point that we're making. Well, he alone lived a sinless life. If you look back to your notebook, when we think about living without sin, we need to think both positively, that's one of the blanks, and negatively, that's the other blank. You see, Jesus' sinlessness is not just that he didn't do wrong. It's that every minute of every day, he was doing the right thing at the right time. John 8, 29 tells us about that, where Jesus said, I always do what pleases the Father. Now, 
he was doing, if you'll go back down here, it says this means every minute, those are your blanks, of every day, he was doing the right thing at the right time. That's an awesome thing to think about. Perfect timing, perfect action. And we can only dream of that. Uh, but that is exactly how Jesus' life was. And sinlessness includes that. It is not just avoiding the evil, uh, but it is always doing what pleases the Father which is exactly what Jesus said that he did. Because he was without sin, he could be a perfect sacrifice for our sins, and that's exactly what the Bible teaches us. His death on the cross would tug at the hearts of all people. The death and resurrection of Jesus is still a source of controversy. Those who are skeptical always try to discredit the story of his resurrection. They recognize that on that single fact pivots the entire impact of the message of Jesus Christ. I maintain that people in a country like ours would never have heard the name of Jesus had he not risen from the dead. By all outward appearances, he was defeated and his cause was lost. But his resurrection made the difference. Well, Jesus said, and I, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to me. When we share the message of Christ confidently and clearly, that message tugs at people's hearts. I have a friend, you're going to like his name, Paul Savage. Paul Savage spent his life as a missionary in Tanzania, Africa. One of the things he did there was go out into the areas among the Mosai tribesmen with a generator and a projector and show them the film. Uh, about Jesus, uh, just a gospel film based on the gospel of Luke. And when he got to the crucifixion among some of the Maasai that had never heard the story of Jesus, that's amazing to us, he said when he would be crucified, they would say in Swahili, stop it, stop it, he is a good man. They would get angry. They didn't, it, to them it was happening. They had never seen television or a movie in their lives and it looked as if this was happening before their eyes. And they were moved and, and really infuriated by the injustice of the crucifixion of Christ. And hundreds upon hundreds of them, when told more about Jesus, uh, followed him and trusted him. I think sometimes in our own country, uh, we are gospel hardened. Uh, but there where they have not heard the gospel, they're deeply impacted uh, by the crucifixion of Christ. You see, I believe that people everywhere know instinctively that somehow Jesus' death has something to do with them. For instance, when Mel Gibson came out with the Passion of the Christ, there was such an outcry in the media. Oh, he's being anti-Semitic and various other criticisms. Oh, it's so bloody, so violent. Well, why were they reacting that way? Let me answer with scripture. And I, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. The pull of the gospel was annoying them, and they were fighting back against it, as men always have. But some respond. Many respond. God's remedy for our sin is Jesus Christ crucified.